forward to weekly daily Wednesdays where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, and talk about all the cool things that we found going on in the world of Linux, open source, and all that fun jazz. I'm Vin, and that is one recovering Jill. She's making, uh, yeah. might make a few <laughs> sneezy noises, but that's cool. Yeah. It just adds to the flavor, and there's one Pedro Mateus. <laughs> Hello. Who figured out that it does indeed get cold. In the yeah, it does. <laughs> it hit yeah. zero while I was walking home today at like four. It's like, oh, it's a bit nippy. Pull out my phone. Zero. Oh, that explains why then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's real cold. <laughs> well, at least, you know, you're like, mm, maybe I need to go inside. You're not out there going. Yeah, out. it's like, let's just, you know, make that brisk walk home. Turn that 15 minute walk into a 10 minute you know, power walk power. Uh, trip. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> power ah, rock. <laughs> that's what it takes. Jill, how's scale preparation going? Oh, wonderful. Um, so we got our Linux Chicks LA booth, as usual, and also got Strider Elutris booth for scale. Yay! So Linux Gamecast will have uh, several booths uh, uh, that us hosts and uh, a chat room can hang out at. And cool. the organizers know that Lynx Gamecast will have an even bigger presence this year at the con. So I'm really, really excited. <laughs> Yay! I don't know, man. I didn't want a booth. We should have got Strider like a stool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Strider in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the corridor. It's like, so what are you? Lutris. Well, no, no. Here's, here's the thing. It's a, a cost-cutting operation. We don't actually get them. We, we just put a stool yeah. out and tell them. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, he, he did used to just have one chair at the open SUSE mm. booth, so so it is an upgrade. <laughs> Pedro, how's Northumbria these days? Uh, it's uh, again, it's it, it's cold, but it's nice. And I uh, I would well, I was going to take this time to issue a bit of a retraction on something I said last week. No, you're not, but we'll get to that when it comes time for the feedback, shall we? Yeah, <laughs> double yes. down on being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a lot. I, I've been wicked, wicked busy the past couple of days. Uh, yeah, redoing some of the back end stuff here mm -hmm. at the studio and the way we're doing things hopefully making everything work, making things do what they're not supposed to, because apparently I've turned that into a hobby. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're doing a Linux it. user. Come on. Yeah. And right. you're doing it very well, Ben. You, you're progressing uh, the technology of podcasting, of Linux podcasting. And that's, that's wonderful. That never crossed my mind. Uh, <laughs> I did take apart the 980, though. The old crusty 980. <laughs> MSI, you guys are uh, evil, like dark, like my level of like, really? <laughs> Just, you know, because it, it had a bum fan in it, right? And that's not a mm -hmm. big deal. Okay, let's set it down. It's not going to be the easiest thing to get into. It wasn't too bad until I got down to the actual wiring harness on the fan cables, which are like fused steel too. This is not sheet metal. Into the heat sink. The, the only way to cut those out, cut those out. It's yeah. like with some serious wire <laughs> snips. You're not going to do it with a um, 10 snips. Anyway, that, that was my experience. I kind of wish I recorded it because there was a great, you know, you know, all right. When you can't get into something, when you're taking something apart, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. And you're like, mm -hmm. what am I missing? I know I'm missing <laughs> something. This isn't, yeah. <laughs> there's some, that, mm, I got up, went to YouTube, had to watch YouTube videos. It's like, oh. No, you, you just have to physically, like, cut this out in order to get the wiring harness out. <laughs> so I felt a little better. <laughs> that was immediately canceled out by, like, that is dumb engineering. Yes. <laughs> which I guess maybe at the end of the day, even it's like, people never expected this to be taken apart, which is quite obvious by the assembly. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> And if you are taking it apart, chances are you're taking the entire heat sink out of it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. tedious work. <laughs> it was done. It was put back together, man. Maybe we should just do, you know, re replace our render box and our broadcasting box with uh, this new hotness. Oh, yes. how about we don't? <laughs> we don't. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Too low. Because, low power. yeah, this is the uh, the Asus Chrome bit. It's the CS10. Uh, and it's basically a uh, USB slash HDMI stick 
that you plug into the, into the back of your TV or your uh, monitor that you have lying about, and it'll turn it into a smart device. Of course, it comes with the Rockchip 3288, uh, two gigabytes of RAM and 16 gigabytes of um, eMMC memory. Uh, so. It's not a powerhouse, and the big news here is, of course, that Amazon uh, had this particular uh, Chrome bit on a very nice sale. We're talking sub-$90 for what is effectively a working computer. It's not a, like Raspberry Pi level, although I'm pretty sure the Raspberry Pi B3 Plus is more powerful than it this. Comes in pink. <laughs> yes. It does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's the one I want. <laughs> but yeah, it's a uh, it's a Chrome bit. It it is a uh, Chrome box in a TD tidy form factor that requires an external power supply. Uh and it's uh yeah, it's got all the amenities that you'd expect. It's got dual band uh, AC Wi-Fi. It's got Bluetooth 4.0. It has the one singular uh, USB 2.0 uh, connector, and it's not being used for power. In fact, that is very much limited to 500 milliamps. So you're not going to be charging your phone off of that. <laughs> It'll, at most, you'll be driving a keyboard or a remote control or something. <laughs> I don't know. I thought this was an interesting thing just to put in because of the price. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, the price oh, is definitely. interesting, but it's very, very underpowered to the point where um, Android apps don't even work unless you sideload them yourself. <laughs> well, you know, as they point yeah. out, you know, Chrome is proprietary. Uh, big deal. Mm -hmm. But eight, eighty-five dollars, it might be something to play around. I, I kind of looked at it though, looking at the specs, and was like, oh man, does a Chromebook have too many features for you? <laughs> Matt, <dude. laughs> <laughs> Joel, what are your cool. thoughts What's on this? Why would you want yeah. a, it's like a technically a well, chrome stick? I don't know what you'd call yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it actually gets uh, um, a lot of the articles I looked at gives a really um, a top 10 rating for uh, the best stick PCs out there that you can buy. And it's it's a way to use a Chrome OS uh, without having to buy a Chromebook or a Chromebox. Um, and it's inexpensive. Uh, and like Ven showed, the the uh, black one is $85.36, and the pink one, pink one, because it must be rare, is $124.13. Mm. <laughs> but I still like that pink one. And, I was about uh, to say, uh, so you've already <laughs> ordered it. <laughs> Soon, yes. Actually, I did put it in the shopping cart. <laughs> And uh, this is actually a cool device because Google and Asus had collaborated on the Chromebook, Chromebit, and released it in November of 2015. And it's cheaper than the $150 Intel Compute Stick, which I know is power more powerful, but the Compute Stick runs Windows 10. Blech. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at least you can run Linux on the Chromebit, and you can you know sideload uh, a different hey, version Jill, of Android hey, on hey, Jill. it. <laughs> Hey Jill, you can also run Linux on the crow, uh, on the uh, compute stick. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. I know. I know. But, nope. but yeah, you have to nuke and pave Windows and then put yeah Linux yeah. on there. <laughs> I don't know. For eighty five dollars, maybe it'll be something to play around with. The only thing I'm not a fan of is having to drag around that eighteen watt power supply. Like, yeah. yeah, that's that's yeah. the big shortcoming. It's like, uh, you know how every other compute stick takes its power from USB 2.0? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one requires a separate power supply. Initially, mm -hmm. when I was looking at it, I was like, maybe I can make a Chromecast. Like, yeah, or you could just buy a Chromecast for half the price. It's like, that's right. Yeah, I think yeah. we'll stick to that. <laughs> okay, um, Akira. Words I never thought I'd get to say uh, pertaining to a story on this show. Yeah. <laughs> no, this isn't the uh, awesome, awesome uh, anime movie from the eighties, yes. early nineties. Oh, uh, uh, I, 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 we we can say this since before you were born. Yes. Uh, no, I was born in eighty six. That came out in eighty nine. Oh, okay, eighty. Right. Yeah, that's right. You are. But okay. yeah, no, this uh, this has nothing to do with that. And you see, uh, Mister Talking Head right there. Uh, he is the person who's basically that's... the ideas man behind the Ak uh, the Akira project. And what he's trying to do is hire three, maybe four developers to 
finish his project, which is a UI editor that's not reliant on GTK or Qt or basically anything else. He also gives the examples like, oh yeah, you could use Inkscape or you could use GIMP or you can use Photoshop or you could use uh, Vala for programming oh, languages. Oh man, no, the code base is going to be in GTK3, man. It's not going to be in Qt. It's a horrible project. You know what? <laughs> yeah. I, know, I know somebody said that. I know they have. <laughs> I'm not saying I, I'm just doing my interpretation of that person. Yeah, yeah. but it, even though the UI that you will get for Akira will be uh, mostly written in uh, GTK, the resulting uh, bits that you create yourself will be comp completely independent from both GTK and Qt, which is very good and it's something that we don't have a lot of in Linux because if you go look at UI editors or theme creators for be it GTK or Qt, they're very heavily focused on those and not much of anything else. So this one, uh, he started a Kickstarter for... Uh, 37, almost 38,000 pounds, and he gives the breakdown of where the money will go, and it actually seems reasonable, to be honest, for like three months' work for three people, plus the accountant, plus everything that uh, Kickstarter takes. Pardon me. And tax. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a very sensible goal. So, Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. For fifteen hundred dollars, you get that one hour of video chat. That, that's kind of <laughs> tempting. <laughs> yes. uh, about, no, if you want to give the fifteen hundred, you by all means give the fifteen hundred. Just skip on. The chat. No, think about it. If, like if you get to pick, I'm like, what are we going to talk about for an hour? Grilled cheese, <laughs> hot sauce. <laughs> Yeah, so I was actually really excited uh, about Akira because a proper open source UX UI interface design tool is needed on Linux for creating both web and mobile interfaces. It is so needed by our developers right now. And uh, Akira will be equivalent to proprietary apps like Sketch, Figma, or Adobe XD. So it's nice to have a non-proprietary version of that. Yep. <laughs> <It'd> be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm done with that. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with Popey. I mean, we absolutely need yeah. more design software on Linux for people who know how to design things. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am not these people. I attempt, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. I mean, look at this. Come on. Think about it. Yeah, and having uh, yeah. a good uh, front-end design tool that's mm -hmm. not completely based on GTK or completely based on Qt running natively on Linux. And that's one of the things that uh, Foxy pointed out in the comments in the show yes. notes. Uh, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. no electron shenanigans here. Yes. yes. Very <laughs> How nice. How can you make a modern application without the use of electron? It's not right. Aww. GTK. <laughs> you use Vala and GTK. <laughs> but I want it to run via Chromium. <laughs> I mean, GNOME 3 already runs off of JavaScript for the most part, so might as well. <laughs> well, let, let's go for something that uh, that I, I I am actively trying to figure out how to use, how to use, Aww. and it is actively defeating me. She's like, you're yeah, so a dumb this, man. This, this app is one that you can uh, uh, create designs, uh, UX and UI uh, interface designs with. And that is Inkscape. Inks, Inkscape 0.92.4 has been released with lots of new updates and bug fixes. Yay. And actually, one of my my favorites and, and one of the ones I'm I'm excited to show my students is that now... Multiple objects can now be aligned as a group relative to another single object. This makes moving many objects at one time to the location of another object much easier as they are aligned better and snap to the individual object coordinates, depending on the alignment tools you want to use, such as center vertically, horizontally, et cetera, et cetera. And this just makes life a lot easier because often when you're moving lots of objects in the programs, they get off alignment. And this is true with Adobe Illustrator, with Corel Draw. It, it was always an issue. So kudos to Inkscape for fixing that and, and including that utility. And also, now you can hold shift click, uh, sh uh, shift click or control click on control handles of shapes without Inkscape crashing. And uh, that was huge. <laughs> that, that was that was always a problem. Um, it's been an issue for a very long time. So if it, I, I found when I had a lot of lot of control handles I was manipulating, it would crash a lot. 
So they fix that and they improve the speed of processing and saving large files and large Adobe Illustrator files. Yay! I have imported AI, AI, AI files in Inkscape many times and know how slow they are to process. I mean, literally, it, 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 it can take, you know, 15, 20 minutes sometimes for, for large files <laughs> to, to save and process. So that was huge. And uh, you can you could uh, go look at the link in the show notes. There are, are tons of of more new updates and bug f- fixes. Okay, so Jill, you cl- you know a lot about Inkscape. Chances are you've used it a lot. So yes. let's say an idiot like myself, uh, who doesn't know how to Inkscape, decides to try this version. It's it's not going to make my life any easier, is it? <laughs> well. Nope. It will if you want to, want to move a lot of objects. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I can select everything and then uh, horizontally yeah. and vertically center them to each other. Yeah, I can yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny thing. <laughs> it's good to see I'm definitely working on the back end of that. Um, Inkscape is a little bit guilty of having a uh, developer interface. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yes. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, one thing I do want to point out, and this is really the big big takeaway this mm-hmm. latest version will not support windows xp yes <laughs> yes <laughs> dang dang <laughs> <laughs> and you hear china just go well what well, do we use now <laughs> listen yes. man do not be xps all right <laughs> we're not about that you and your weird misshapen mug it does run in a virtual machine just fine, so that works. <laughs> How and why I transitioned to Linux. <laughs> How you can, too. Um, <laughs> this was written by Larry Singer. You might know him. Kind yeah. of made the Wikipedia. It's definitely mm-hmm. a thing. I mean, he was the founder. Um, and he goes basically through the experiment of why I use Linux, how I got started, and why I continue to use it, you know, going through the entire experiment of like, what's this Linux thing? Maybe I'll put it in a VM. Hey, this is kind of neat. And, you know, what are the reasons behind it, you know, the privacy or anything like that? And what really caused me to switch, how I did it, and the end results? It's like, that's neat. That's well written. He did a good job of that. You know, something, I think it's written more towards the tone. It's a personal blog post, but you can hand it to somebody maybe not hyper technically adept no like okay i i can dig that and get the cut of the jib one thing this is something i wanted to ask both of, both of you is with i see this a lot and he did it as well experimenting with linux in a vm which i kind of yeah. get but i also feel that that's going to like double the amount of time if you're the type of person yeah. who's eventually going to get to linux if you have mm-hmm. like, oh, look, I can just close the Linux and go back. And I mean, between yeah. that and uh, dual booting uh, your current work machine, I think VM is like the least committal approach. And so it makes sense. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, virtual box, which is the one he used, uh, actually has pretty good performance if you install the, um, the add-ons plugin. And you install the add-ons in the uh, currently uh, being hosted the guest operating system. Uh, so it's yeah, it's a perfectly acceptable way to try Linux to like dip your toes in without actually committing yeah. to you know taking a dive. I th- think that's fine. It's only going to exacerbate any and all issues that you may mm. come across at any yeah. point, and. Um, yeah, I guess if you just want to see what this Linux thing is all about, VM is possibly the way to go. No, Pedro, Linux yeah. is hard. You have to recompile your kernel every time you change a sound setting and other things that I've read on Reddit that are like Aww. genuinely two decades. It was like, you got to re-up your excuses, kids. Mm-hmm. Unless your name is yeah. Gary Newman, at which point you can't even get a Ubuntu VM up and running. But this. that's he's for another a, show. like a cat. I was like, oh, man, he can't help himself. Jill, give me some positivity. Yes, yes. So um, actually, to answer your question, I normally, when I'm, I'm showing new people uh, Linux, is uh, the USB flash drive, uh, uh, live flash drive technique. Um, I generally use that over virtual machines, but it depends on the, the user and, and what their needs are. 
But for a quick introduction, just booting from a flash drive and even um, setting it up so they can save to the flash drive to test out Linux and know they, they just pull it out to reboot to Windows <laughs> so or Mac OS. So that works well, too. But this was a really, really well-written article. And um, what I really liked that Larry Sanger uh, talked about was, was how easy it is to find resources online and don't be afraid to ask for help. Yes. Yeah, he did help create Wikipedia. So he, he knows a little bit about that. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. And it's just, I, it's just so refreshing to see more articles being written about how easy it really is to transition to Linux for new users by Jason Evangelo from Forbes and the like. It's just, it's just been really wonderful. I've been noticing more and more of them in the last few months and months and the more, the better. And, um, another point I'd like to make is that most modern Linux installers like Ubuntu's have an install a Linux alongside Windows options, so no users don't now users don't even have to learn how to make partitions. And yeah. often when I'm showing people, uh, you know, when I'm running Ubuntu or Linux Mint or wh whatnot, I just show them that option. You know, make sure yeah. to back up their data under Windows, and then show them that option, so they don't even have to learn how to partition. <laughs> And that's actually so one that's of the things thing. he he mentions. It's like, oh yeah, the install yeah. it. There's still a bit of a learning curve, but it's a curve. It's not like running into a brick wall like it was a couple of years yes. back. That's a, yeah, that's true. Uh, but <laughs> there's even one better way uh, to not have to get into that learning curve. You just buy yourself yeah. a laptop from your Entrowares yes. or your Tuxedos or really <laughs> any of the others. And uh, you get yourself a Linux, a fully integrated yes. MacBook-like experience, but for <laughs> Linux, where you can yes. just about change everything that you want on your new laptop. However, and I strongly it... suggest <laughs> try Linux before you go out and buy something Oh, yeah, no, no seriously. <laughs> just spin it up in a VM. <laughs> now we're back to that. Um, yes. That that works. Yeah. Um, it is so much easier these days. I mean, if you're Linux curious, yeah. because, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I even go back to like installing early versions of Red Hat with, remember the big thick book that you bought that came with a free copy? Of oh, Red Hat? yes. Mm -hmm. I remember setting up partitions. Like I felt like I was entering nuclear launch codes. So like, I don't know how this is going. Now pop it in, get done with it, and have fun. Jill, I know you like showing new people Linux. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's kind of fun to show old people Linux as well. Yeah, so definitely. Ray, man, he's like, how switching my parents over to Linux <laughs> saved me a lot of headache and support calls. Basically, this guy, he's living the dream. He's doing something we've <laughs> all thought about at some point. <laughs> yes. And, you know, more than a few of us have implemented this solution. Um, he walks through the reasons behind, hey, why do I want to do this? How do I want to do it? And what's good ideas followed by bad ideas, you know, just a good <laughs> advice to yeah. taking, you know, grandpa, grandma, mom or dad uh, over to the Linux side. And, you know, it's mixed in good with bad. Okay, mm -hmm. 100%. Uh, kind of walks through the programs and what he's going to be replacing stuff with. And he, find, you know, he went through you know, the cons and pros of different distributions, your chat, um, elementary OS, Solus, and stuff like that. He ended up with Ubuntu. And I was like, okay, that's kind of neat. And so let's just roll it back. Mm -hmm. The main reason you would do this would be security and quit calling me. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> these are the two main reasons. And you can set this up with an auto update and just set it and forget it. That's the working theory everyone has. It never works out mm -hmm. like that. It never yeah. does. Um, <laughs> mainly with, you, you want to find out, can you f figure out what programs they, they use and can they run it? Because they'll be like, no, I don't want it. And then they'll get somebody to come over and reinstall Windows XP, which will no longer be supported. Uh, the only question <laughs> I had is he chose to give them GIMP for image editing. And it's, someone's been using GIMP for a long time. That's not a good experience for anyone. I mean, that mm -hmm. 
I, I'm thinking like Tux Paint or like Google yeah, yeah, Photos. Yes. Pinta. Yes. Seriously. Pinta. Yeah, it, Pinta. It, yeah, Pinta is actually really nice. Just get that up and running and they'll go, oh, look, I can edit my pictures. There you go. <laughs> and while you might not like it, I, I completely understand using Ubuntu as opposed to like whatever the late hotness is you know i'm just like don't don't go throwing arch on the box just just don't yeah, do yourself don't. a favor by doing that <laughs> now i like this i like this sly guy it's like oh clever girl um bring an ssd mm-hmm. and swap that out on their box mm-hmm. yes that's, and, that's and a, that was a really great point <laughs> look the person who brought you into this world right in the eye and go linux was responsible for this let them yes. believe that. <laughs> Tell them no differently. Um, another thing, make sure you set up a printer. Old people, they love, they love, yeah. they love killing trees and it brings them joy. So make sure you have a printer set up so they continue doing that. Auto login. What do you two think about this? I was like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. No definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's like a stay at home computer, just auto login immediately yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, you know me personally if i do this i am a huge fan of like four to seven big honks this comes back to what programs do you use and those have big honking icons and like there you go it's like the jitterbug pc when i get done with it (laughs) yeah (laughs) one occasion just i hope i never get to this point but i mean you know, humanity being, you know, creatures of habit and pattern recognition and all that replaced a Firefox logo or two with Edge or something that looked exploratory-ish yes. because, you know, that doesn't <laughs> compute to, that's the icon that is like, no, that's internet button. <laughs> yeah, that's the internet button is what people recognize. It's like, oh, it's that blue E. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I found that these techniques that Simon Frey used are very similar. I used myself teaching a family over to Linux. Uh, Very, very good tips. And I really like the fact that he mentioned not to go over an hour at a time when introducing a new user or family to Linux because they can become overwhelmed. And yes, that is just so very true. So do it a step at a time, an hour here, an hour there. Don't don't do it all at once, spend the whole day. (laughs) Or they'll just get upset at you. (laughs) And um, also, remember to change the boot order in the BIOS back to hard drive after installing Linux from the flash drive. (laughs) I I remember having to do that before. (laughs) And my biggest advice as a teacher and someone who shows new users how to use Linux on a regular basis, basis is to have patience. Just have patience. I know sometimes it is hard with family, but just, just, just have patience. <laughs> eh, patience is, uh, I guess, uh, important. But if you make it look, and I did this over Christmas with my mom's old uh, AAA PC, uh, because she still uses that. It's like uh, since she, uh, now she's teaching in Lisbon and she goes to Lisbon a lot and she needed something like really tiny that she could easily carry with her. And the old AAA PC is still working, but Windows XP was getting a little bit slow, mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's like, okay, tell you what, I'll get it up and running real nice, SSD, <laughs> put in uh, my old um, Vertex 3 SSD, it's 120 gigabytes. I installed uh, Shubuntu 18.04 32-bit because it's an atom processor. That's <laughs> that's all I can do. Uh, the mm-hmm. then I installed Wine and uh, Microsoft Office tw- uh, 2007 uh, and Chromium for the web browsing. And she already recognizes the uh, the Chrome uh, icon because that's what she uses. So it's like uh, it's just it's the same, but it's blue. Cool. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah. No, it turns out that that machine, once you put an SSD in it with Chromium and Office 2017 and Master PDF Editor so she can do some PDF stuff, it's actually a very good machine for, like, just productivity. That That's all she needed it for. So there it is. Ah, perfect. And, yeah. Shubuntu 18.04 is actually a... Mm-hmm. Really nice LTS to work off of because it's like bare bones XFC as you can expect. So you can you make that look like Windows 10, which is very easy, mm-hmm. mind you. 
Yes. And it's like, oh, look, <laughs> you know how to work this. <laughs> Seems legit. Um, yeah. There's there's nothing wrong with it. Just make sure if you're going to do something like this, you preferably, uh, much as I don't even like doing this, make sure you can SSH into that box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, install uh, yeah. In, install mm -hmm. Team Viewer. I left yeah, Team, team viewer, viewer installed. <laughs> okay. All my mom see. needs to do yeah. is uh, <laughs> run it, and then I can just go in. <laughs> if you want to do it easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, SSH. <laughs> that's great. Um that's awesome. Okay. Uh multi monitor setup. Yay, which we all here have, of course. One um, or two. One this or two. is Yes, one or two. This is A Rander. A Rander is a simple visual front end for the X Rander terminal utility that allows you to change the configurations, positions, and resolutions for multiple monitor setups. Yes, uh, this is, you know, we, we need this um, in the community so much, especially for those of us who also have AMD rating cards and their driver, their Mesa drivers don't come with this ability. So I, I'm often referring to this on my AMD uh, Radeon machines. And it really has come a long way since 2013 and is now one of the best XRander front end GUI utilities. And I remember, you know, testing it out years ago and it would it would frequently crash. So they've they fixed a lot fixed a lot of bugs. And um, yes, I have spent many tedious days editing monitor resolutions, configurations, and positions with XRander and plugging those modes into xorg.conf before there were GUI utilities. So <laughs> this just makes life a whole lot easier and much quicker. 100% <laughs> through this in because I had to go looking around with it. It's something I've gotten to play with on the these two boxes that uh, you lot are on. It yeah. can be a nightmare, even just when you're doing yes. it. Every yeah. desktop manager is going to ship with something that's going to attempt mm -hmm. to pull this off. Uh, emphasis yeah. on that word attempt. To attempt, mm -hmm. yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're using Intel Integrated Graphics, this is your new best friend. Yes. And it's going to make <laughs> your life a lot easier. So yeah. I just wanted to get that. You mentioned it looks a lot better. It is really easy to set up. Now, if you're dealing with... Um, NVIDIA, they got a pretty good solution as well. Yeah, but it's use all... the NVIDIA settings uh, yes. option. Yes. Just, just yeah. use that. <laughs> uh, this one, uh, it's got a new release, and uh, they mentioned how important persistence is. And yes, it is very important because chances are, if you want, if you are setting up your monitors in a certain way, you want that to stick. And a lot of these tools, uh, like LXD ships with, and KDE ships with, KDE actually does a pretty good job with persistence. It's just that some of them mm -hmm. completely forget. It's like, oh, people are setting this, so we should probably save this for when they start X next. And yes. Uh, the one thing I would like to see is uh, for something like A Render or any of the other um, X Render based GUIs, something that gives me everything that x render can do but mm -hmm. from a gui i mean if you're already doing a gui for x render why are you deliberately gimping it and not giving me all the options give oh, me all the options Pedro, you missed the <laughs> yeah. days of taking a status <laughs> at it in xor config well xf yeah, I, I didn't miss the days uh, yeah. i still have to have an xor conf for these three monitors <laughs> that, that's why i corrected myself yeah. x386 x, x <laughs> config man Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, Multi-monitor support is not really too big of an issue on Linux these days. It pretty much Correct. just works. And yes. that's awesome. Um, HTTPS. It's cool. Mm -hmm. You should mm -hmm. use it. There's not a mm -hmm. reason not to use it. Not <laughs> and like none. Like nada. Nope. Um, why are we talking about that? Well, remote code execution and app get. Yep. Come on, That's right. Ubuntu. Found a vulnerability in app <laughs> that allowed hey, the network yeah. man in the middle, <laughs> malicious back to manager, to execute arbitrary code as root on a machine installing any mm -hmm. package. Now, the bug has been fixed in the latest version of app. If you're worried about it being exploited during the update process, you can protect yourself, and there'll be a link to this, uh, along with everything else in the show notes. But, yeah, 
this is these are things you need need to keep an eye on. I know the VLC was having an issue about the why aren't you using HTTPS? Yeah. And to which I just want to say yeah. seriously, you know, just because you do not think having HTTPS enabled and it's fine and there's not going to be an exploit doesn't mean the other people share your opinion and they will find mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And if you have any kind of presence on the internet, you really, really yes. <laughs> want to have SSL enabled for just about everything that you do. And I'm very much in that camp. In 2019, you have zero excuse not to be running SSL. <laughs> CPU cache is big enough that even the most complex uh, certificates will just take no time at all to process. It's There's no excuse just run yeah. SSL, just HTTPS, run <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Just run it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, us Linux users have become so complacent in regards to security of our apt repositories because so, so few security issues have popped up. But now that Linux is becoming more popular, more security over repositories needs to be first and foremost so we can keep Linux the most secure operating system in the world. We, we we need to keep that precedent. So th this is very, very important. <laughs> yep. That's yeah. the thing. Um, if you want to get super secure, just take out Ethernet noodle in the back. Why not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> really boring experience. Unplug! <laughs> then you will no longer be able to communicate. But don't worry, Google's trying to fix that for you as well. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Google decided, you know what? Uh, this uh, Hangouts thing, there's a lot of people using it, but we don't like it anymore, so we're going to kill it. And they've been trying to do that since, I don't know, 2017. Uh, because in 2017, they introduced this really awesome feature, which allowed you to use Google Hangouts as your SMS uh, client as well on Android. And that was great. I love that. It's like I could have one app to do mm -hmm. all my Hangouts and all awesome. my texts. That's great. And then they decided a couple of months later, eh, no. We're just going to can that. And then they pulled the Hangouts out from uh, Google+. Plus, and that was basically the beginning of the end. Um, Google+, Plus is already going the way of the dodo. And apparently, come the end of uh, 2019, or October 2019, uh, it'll be up to Google to specify exactly when the Hangouts will be going away. And... Yeah, if anyone didn't see this coming at this point, you need new glasses, basically. <laughs> I don't trust yeah. glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So make sure to use Google Takeout, the application to back up all your data from Hangouts and Google+. Plus. In fact, I, I just did that recently for Google+, Plus last week. So, And that's a really good utility, and, 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 and it's linked in the show notes in the article. So, and thank you to Empty for posting this in chat. This is, mm -hmm. this was awesome. So is, <laughs> you know, to find Pedro, out. Is this going mm -hmm. to be the chat hangouts? Like hangouts.google.com, <laughs> is that going away or what? Uh, hangouts.google.com will eventually go away. Wow, wow. But yeah. until October 2019, according to this article, it's okay. It's just that they're phasing it out for G Suite users. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're running the full mm -hmm. G Suite in your business or even at home for some reason, uh, you can, uh, starting from April 16, you get the option whether or not to disable classic Hangouts and you can move everyone to chat uh, or whatever the other one is called. And then uh, you can, uh, come September uh, 2019, Google will completely shut down Hangouts for everyone in the G Suite. Mm. So basically, at that point, it's just end users, people like us, who use uh, Hangouts on a regular basis, uh, who will be left with it. And it remains to be seen what Google will decide to do at that point. They're going to kill it. <laughs> uh, we don't have to worry about it. I mean, there's like genuinely six different messaging apps with Google on Android right yeah. now. It is. Uh, what is it? Oh, yeah. Pope said it might be meet.google yeah. or, yeah. or whatever. I agree with you. Or, <laughs> <There's plenty yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah. Popey. You're on. <laughs> yes. 100 proof. Sin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last and least. Uh, oh, uh, Ven, you did a thing. I, I did a thing every yes. now and then. I try to be useful. This is uh, one of our categories, a hardware thing. We, we got a fancy new short bus video card, a 26DFE. And, you know, we, we got it for the NVN code. 
on GTX, some stuff that's coming out later uh, this month with OBS. But, however, it can technically play the video games, and it could probably run Blender, too. I haven't even tried that. Mm -hmm. So I just ran it through some benchmarks. Um, wholly unscientific, but we tried to make it look pretty so people could figure out, hey, what's going on? What numbers does it spit out? Which it did. You know, it's definitely not a bad card. Even at the price for three hundred and fifty dollars, uh, if you're like me and you completely skipped over the ten series, and you want something that's going to do solid ten eighty or fourteen forty performance, and it's sort of cheap, I'm going to say, you know, hey, why not go check it out? Uh, I'm not sure who this card's targeted for because it is like they went down a checklist of what I wanted for a card to put in our box. To stream with, I was like, really? <laughs> you're, you're making and people were uh, upset that a couple of camps, wasn't it, Pedro? You had people already. You have the price camp. And you're like, yes, the price <laughs> camp because it's a sixty series card for three fifty plus tax. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's a bit of an ask. The the, the 60s yeah. have, have always been like the mid to high end uh, cards, and they were usually in the 250 ish dollar range. Right now, you're asking a hundred dollars on top of that. I guess that's what not having any competition does. But yeah, it's <laughs> uh, that was very much one of the arguments. Mm. That was definitely a thing. A lot of people said that. And then you have people who are sitting back going, well, wait a minute, which I think a lot of that kind of got confirmed mm -hmm. last night, earlier today, that we will definitely be seeing an 1160 or 611, whatever oh, they yeah. want, you know, 1660 Ti or whatever, Turbo yeah. Monkey Weasel 9000, <laughs> whatever they're going to call it, it really yeah. doesn't matter. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's the one. That thing, at least in my not so humble opinion, because uh, what I'm reading is they're like, well, that that is just going to be a 2060 with you know no tensor cores. I mean, it's just going to be a chop down. You know, mm -mm. Mm. I, I don't think for a minute that I, I think when mm. that comes out, when we see that maybe next month or month after that, it might be about half as fast as a 1070, kind of. No, the half is a bit too low. It'll probably trade blows with the 1070. Uh, that seems to be like the operate reasonable people on the internet. That's where the speculation seems to be going right now. Uh, but yeah, it right now it's all rumor mill because yes, mm -hmm. Nvidia have basically been hinting. Yes, we're yeah. going to be releasing a touring card that's of the 10 series because it doesn't have mm -hmm. tensor or ray tracing cores. That 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 seems to be the thing. Well, I don't think but, Nvidia is going to sell a part that is equal to an RTX no. series, you know, yeah. 2060, 2070, 2080, with just the RTX <laughs> cut off. Because I don't think they want to say, okay, well, this is, you know, you're paying an RTX tax. Mm -hmm. and this is no, what the no, 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 no. See, they uh, you already have examples that they wouldn't do that because if you go back to the 980 and the 970, uh, they saw the 970, oh, this is basically performing like a 980. All right, let's cut a few of the ROPs out and make it three and a half gigs. And yeah, we all saw what happened after that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> chances are if this comes out uh, using that exact same GPU that the 2060 is using, it's going to have a few ROPs uh, cut out. It's going to have less CUDA cores. It's going to have less memory, probably. So yeah, yeah you're looking at a 1070-ish video card maybe more reasonably priced maybe around the 300 dollar mark because nvidia kind of needs something that's less than 300 dollars right now unless you want to buy a 1050 ti or something <laughs> yeah, interesting times yeah. i mean basically nvidia can just release whatever they feel like releasing you know yeah not having any yeah. competition kind of does that <laughs> <laughs> Yes. AMD looking squarely at you. What's that Radio, uh, Radeon Technologies Group doing right now? They're working on Navi. Quit hating on them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they released the Radeon 7. Kind of a joke there. Hey, AMD, AMD kind of came out yesterday. Uh, I think that was in the uh, through Forbes. Uh, somebody was talking to someone with the Radeon Group or the like. And they said, hey, we're, we're committed to having drivers for the uh, new... Uh, Oh, yes. Hotness coming out uh, next month. The community is doing them. 
it doesn't yes. matter. I I, I I had to clap, and I'm like, yeah, you're going, you're going to have drivers ready for a product you're releasing? Go. <laughs> yeah. Progress. progress. The community drivers. is doing the drivers, but progress nonetheless. <laughs> hey, it's a brilliant thing. If you're thinking about picking up a 2060, uh, go take a look at that if you want, like, confirmation bias or whatever. I mean, that card's mm-hmm. really meant for anybody with a 9 series or below. You know, there's it's not a logical upgrade path. And if you just yeah. bought, you know, a 1070, go find the receipt. Hmm. Yeah, return it, seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, yeah. <laughs> All right. A um, little bit of shilling. Thank everyone. You make this show possible. We are completely community supported. If you want to take part of that nonsense, you can come over to linuxgamecast.com forward slash support. The most important, best, awesome way of doing that is becoming a Patreon, kicking us a few bucks a week. We do have Amazon affiliate links if that's your jam. We got a couple of items on the Wish Zone uh, if you want to get some of that hotness. And hey, Humble Bundle, along with PayPal and uh, Magic Internet Buddies, all make that possible. I do want to point out, we have a store and they rang us up. Yay! I'm like, yo, <laughs> hey, uh, we can do some extra items now Sorry. all of a sudden. And they're like, that can be a thing. And I'm like, Merch. okay, cool. Uh, we're talking like hats and stuff like that. But you see, Jill just held up one of those reject mugs we had. And yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll see. Keep keep an eye out because they, they got to send me proofs of those before uh, we're going on that. Teespring, good t-shirts, not so good mugs. Um, but if you do want to help support this, Nightmare Train on Patreon. You can come hang out in our Discord, get early access to a gang of stuff that we have. And uh, we even have a Creep Creep show we do every Saturday where you can participate. Uh, an extra hour of content. Oh, Patreon did update that RSS feed. So apologies. If you, it's, <laughs> hey, you have 192 whatever new shows. You don't. They just had to update it for some future stuff. Wanted to let everyone know what was happening there. All right. Um mm-hmm. No mattress heads, but it's no <laughs> <Yes>. mattress heads. <laughs> <laughs> Up first, 1.4 yes. pi. Yeah, this is awesome. This is um, add a floppy disk to your Raspberry Pi using the BBC slash FDC floppy disk interface for Raspberry Pi. This allows direct connection of floppy disk drives with 34-pin ribbon cables via the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. And for me, this is actually uh, is definitely a project, as I've literally imaged hundreds of floppy disks over the years to back up my animation files and assets, programs and games, and I've and uh, that I have made, and to preserve old programs and files. And uh, yeah, first I backed up hundreds of these things on uh, SciQuest disks, and then on CDRs. <laughs> so I literally have hundreds. <laughs> So, <laughs> look at all the save icons. Yes, yes. Look at all the save icons. <laughs> and and this one, this what's cute about this one? This is X Wolf, um, which is the X Windows on a floppy disk, a li- Linux bootable Linux floppy. And I put it on on uh, my old, one of my old Earthlink uh, disks that you used to get in the mail. So, <laughs> that, remember that was a thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> so um and you know i still have all the old and vintage computers that the floppy disks were made on but most people don't have access to these old machines so using a modern day raspberry pi for this is the perfect option and you know this is great for you know backing up images to put on um archive internet archive and and whatnot it's 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 basically you know backing up our computer history and it's very important that we have this option <laughs> yeah and on top of the hat you also uh they also mentioned that they found the software bbc fdc which oh, lets yeah. you uh basically get a complete image of whatever floppy disk you happen to have uh like about be it um even if it has issues, uh, what the software lets you do is instead of attempting to interpret mm-hmm. the data, uh, it basically takes an image from the electromagnetic fields. What basically what the drive is seeing, it takes the electromagnetic fields and creates the image off of that. So you get a complete image of the disk itself, which is yeah. really awesome, and it enables forensic tools 
to uh yeah it's uh it's wonderful it's really nice hipsters yeah. both yes. of you I, I, I used a part image and DD to back up all mine. And, and again, you know, I went literally, they went first to my SideQuest drives, which was a thing back in the day. Mm-hmm. Oh, there goes Pedro. <laughs> and then <Back>. to CDRs <laughs> and DVDRs. Poor Pedro. <laughs> we it's, lost him for a minute there. <laughs> I understand it. I mean, it's kind of brilliant that we have something like this. Uh, and old, old floppies. Believe I do. Um, if you were a child of the 90s, you consider the floppies like, one of the, if not the most unreliable way of storing information because, you know, I was in university and yeah, ooh, you look at it yeah. and you lose stuff. I mean, if you had oh yes, yeah. anything, you and... had five or six copies. and But the old ones, believe it or not, are pretty, even 30, 40 yeah. years later, still readable, 100%. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely, a three and a half definitely. inch form factor that for some reason, it's just not very good. <laughs> yeah. It worked. That was the thing. Yeah. So good to so, know. Maybe you want to regale us with your tales of data recovery through <laughs> spinning magnetic media. How would they do that, Pedro? Because... <laughs> well, you can basically be like Jill and hoard all of your save icons. Oh, I was about to say, holding up a handful of save icons probably wouldn't be yeah. the best way to do it. This is Windows 3.1. This is my backup of Windows 3.1. <laughs> See? Save icons. Uh, so the best way to do it is probably, if you want to get in touch with us, of course, is to go to linuxgamecast.com. You hit the contact button. You fill out the form. It just asks for your name, your email, subject, and the message that you would like to communicate to us. Uh, there are other ways to get in touch, of course. You can leave us a comment on YouTube. You can leave us a comment on Patreon if you're one of our Patreons. You always get priority when it comes to that. Uh, and if you see us out on the street... Don't touch me. Oh, God. Free hugs for Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben. So you, uh, you color-coded this one, so I'll let you take it. I color-coded it. <laughs> one of the few things in life um, that brings me joy is when I'm Pedro's wrong a lot, wrong. okay? <laughs> this is why I'm a ball of sunshine most days. Um, yeah. <laughs> Talking about LHQ, Brian writes in, uh, this is from last week. He's like, hey, Data Drake here. Not sure where you heard that LHQ would be integrating with FWUPD, but I currently have no plans to support that. The goal of this tool is to help us identify users' hardware so that we can properly configure our kernels to support them. It may get used in other parts of Solus at some point in the future, but those would be announced in one of our blog posts not by some random poo-poo head on the internet doing a podcast on Wednesday. Might have thrown that last part in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't really have an excuse for this one because uh, what I read it was basically someone commenting on one of the uh, like uh, hack fests that they do. And they mentioned, yeah, LHQ mm. and integrating F. WUPD is like, oh, yes. yeah, no, that sounds great. And no, uh, that's Brian Myers right there. He's the person in charge yeah. of uh, currently developing uh, LHQ, and he's one of the big... Uh, <laughs> he's one of the uh, the big uh, Solus developers right now. So, yeah, no, I'll take his word for it. And again, this is... Take this, basically someone calling me out uh, on the internet again, uh, as my retraction for the slight uh, misleading information what I said last week. No, man. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. You, you got to start out with, well, I remember reading somewhere, and no source. Th- this is a person publicly saying, I'm not picking on you, I'm talking about reading this on the internet. Is that, as somebody publicly saying, prepare yourself for my fanfic. <laughs> 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 oh no, I actually went back and I found a post and it's like, oh, this person is not associated with Solus in any way, shape, or form. I should have realized this. Okay, my bad. <laughs> I don't know, Pedro. I remember reading somewhere. Um <laughs> On the internet of all places. <laughs> no, see, no, that, this one is completely on me, and I am sorry. It's a, yeah. No, though, I still think it's a good idea. You should totally yes, do it, Brian. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brian, thank you. And I read that too, Pedro. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got two people that don't check sources. Lovely. See what I'm dealing yeah. with? Um, 
よ Yay, me. No, that's just fun. That's been real. Hey, if you want to tell us we're wrong, I'm wrong all the time. It's awesome. I love it. And、uh, it's always good to go back and figure that out. It's a learning experience. You're like, hey,、mm-hmm. but you learned something. Now we know more information than we did initially. So, yes.、Yep. I think I, like 100%. That is awesome if you can come back and be like, yo, you know, thanks, Brian. That actually was、yeah. helpful. Yep.、Um, Definitely. <laughs> I think we've got to bounce out of here, but send us your thoughts and maybe your prayers. I don't know how you type out a prayer. Give it a try. We'll read about it next week.、Um, <laughs> we're going to roll some credits, fire up some music, and thank everyone for showing up live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's、Yay. see. Maybe this is going to work. I don't know. Sometimes、Maybe. it does. <laughs> Sometimes it don't. <laughs> Maybe it does. No. There it goes. <laughs> There we go. Yay. Thank you, Ben Stone. <laughs> And thank you, Pedro Mateus. <laughs> And thank you, Jill. No, I was. <laughs> man, why did you say that? I was going to let it get weird. Like, thank you, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what I、Aww. wanted to. Oh boy. <laughs> thank you to our wonderful executive producers and our pro- producers. And thank you,、uh, Popey, for joining us live. It's always a treat when you can come in live. And <laughs> oh boy, we have so many wonderful people in chat realm. And、uh, hey, you're contributing to this weird freeware experiment that we、uh, yes. are doing. Yes.、Yeah. <laughs> Interesting business model we have. <laughs> Keep being awesome. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>